I'm Joy Baird. And I'm Holly Baird, and we are at the 2016 Wisconsin Garden Expo in Madison, Wisconsin. We are on the floor. We've talked to some friends that we have acquainted here, as well as some new products that we think that you'll be very fascinated by. We enjoy coming up here and talking in our three seminars, and if you were one of those that participated in that, we hope you enjoyed and took something away. So let's go on the floor and see what is offered and some of the friends that we are happy to see. I'm here with Victor from Happy Leaf LED and you have a different perspective on growing indoors with LEDs instead of the traditional tube lights that we're all very familiar with. Yes, I, uh, I hope I can show you some cool things here, Joey. And I'm gonna have to apologize because I'm losing my voice, but what we've got here is a little demonstration that we have set up that uses a Burpee T5 fluorescent system and the Happy Leaf LED system. And what I'm going to try to do is do a quick demo of the difference between them. This is a um, Lycor power meter which measures photosynthetically active radiation. And it's the energy that plants use to um, basically grow. Right, right. right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the meter directly underneath the uh, T5 fluorescent system and you can see we're getting about 43 uh, micromoles. Right. And, um, yeah, I don't, yeah, there we go. And typically you need between 30 and 100 micromoles for seed starting. Whereas for the fully growing a plant, you want somewhere between 100 and 300 micromoles. So this particular light source is drawing about 31 watts of power. Okay and the Happy Leaf light source is drawing 29 watts of power. So it's slightly less, but, but over, almost, a, over a year, that's, that's a big deal. Yeah, over a year it's a bit, but a big deal. But what's more important, and this is what I'd like to really show you, okay. is that because of the fact that the light source, the LED light source is so much more efficient, mm -hmm. we're able to cover a much larger area for seed starting. So even all the way out here, we, we have three flats versus the one flat, we're able to get 46 micromoles, so which means that you can cover for the same amount of input power, roughly, you can cover three times the area for seed starting. But what's even more important, because you can't really use this particular light source for growing food indoors because you don't have enough energy, I can take the same um, meter and show you that we're getting dramatically more energy directly underneath the, the light source. So if you place it under the light source, we're getting about 230 or 40 micromoles, which is about six times more useful energy directly under the light. So now you can actually take a, a passive hydroponic method that similar to what I'm gonna show you here, where you put all the water that you need into the, into the container with the nutrients in it, and put the seed into a net pot with some clay pellets, put up to 12 of them under the light, and now you're growing all your leafy greens and herbs directly underneath the, uh, underneath the light source. And they're LEDs. They're LEDs, yeah. And they don't blow out. These have what a, how many, uh, unlimited lifespan, yeah, basically. So, so they'll literally last 20 years. So there's really nothing in here to go bad. Um, if anything ever does go bad, and it may be three to five years out, it's going to be in the power supply, which then you could buy on Amazon for $12, and this light will be good for literally the rest of your life. Now, I want to go over and look at this grow tower here you sure. have for, yeah, yeah. Th this is an, another form of it, and you were talking about you could use peppers, tomatoes, anything that kind of grows vertical. Right. So this is just a way, to sh it's a stand, it's a vertical stand, and I grow my tomatoes, peppers, I know there are people growing orchids that grow taller. I actually have some cucumbers growing in this type of stand as well. We didn't really bring the correct pots for this, but you know, you, you can now grow vertical plants uh, unlimited as well. Height. Unlimited height. Unlimited height, yeah. These stack up in increments of 10 inches to pretty much whatever height. Now for people who want to venture on and, and learn more about your product, what's the best place to find that information? Well, our website is www.happyleafled. Um, and we are going to set up, we have a YouTube channel set up where we're showing people how to set up the passive hydroponic method. So we'll have more and more information on there about different types of containers to use, 
different types of fertilizers, any information we get on what grows well and what doesn't grow well. And the nice thing about these, they're made in the United States. That's correct. They're all made in the Midwest, in fact. So. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Joey. I'm here with Aaron from Cedar Creek Organics, just a few miles down the road from the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardens, and you've got a unique product here that will repel animals from your garden, and we're not talking chemicals, we're not talking firearms, and it doesn't hurt the animals. Talk about what you've got going on here. You are correct. So what we have is our plant saver deer and rabbit repellent, and we have a plant saver squirrel and chipmunk repellent. Both of them are essential oil-based, and they don't have any chemicals, they're all natural ingredients. Now, how, how does one apply this? Because I know you have bulk and you have bag. What, yep. what is the mindset behind this and, and how does this work if it's not a chemical based? It's a good question. So our plant saver deer and rabbit repellent, it comes with little bags. In, and we have a 28 ounce bag. We also have pails. So what you're going to do is you're going to put the product in the little bags, you're going to hang the bags four to six feet around the garden okay. or around the area that you want to protect. And you want to put it lower for squirrel or for, for our rabbits, and then you want to put it higher for the deer. And when you're putting it in the bags, it doesn't wash off with the rain, so it can last up to six months. You also can sprinkle it around your garden or the area you want to protect. And you can, if you want to do the hanging, you can also sprinkle it just as added protection. Our, our chipmunk and our squirrel. Um, product, you are going to put that in with your bird seed. You're also going to put it in with your garden bulbs. Because it's a taste too, because the squirrels are going to not want to get that bird seed. Is it? Absolutely. So it takes about a week and a half, two weeks for them to get used to that taste and they're not going to like it. So they're not going to come back. So the a deer and rabbit repellent is more of a, a smell base. If they can't smell it, it's not going to work. So you really want to make sure that it's appropriate um, height and distance apart. And then our squirrel and chipmunk, that's taste and smell. So you want to make sure that they get enough taste. Now with the, the you said six months application and then you have to, on the bulk it's different because the rain will wash this product out, but, but both are very effective. Correct. So if you do sprinkle it, and you can sprinkle the smaller size as well, um, if you do sprinkle it, it'll be a month and a half, two months. If it's particularly rainy, you do want to make sure that you reapply it right after the big rain. Now that you do have other products here, and I don't want to just focus on this. You've got a poison ivy soap. Explain why that's not poison ivy in the soap. It, it's a help if you have poison ivy. Correct. It really. It, we had that question earlier today, actually. So it contains jewelweed, and so the speckles that you see in the soap is jewelweed, which helps soothe the, the itch that you get after you acquire jewel, or acquire poison ivy. Um, we also have insect repellent cream and spray, and again, all of our products are essential oil based. They're all natural and they're actually good for your skin. Um, the poison ivy soap can be used daily as a daily soap. It, we make sure that the smell is pleasant as well. Um, the poison ivy, or the, I'm sorry, the insect repellent cream that has um, cocoa butter and it has beeswax in it so it's moisturizing. And our spray and our cream are both able to be used with kids and on pets. Uh, where can people find you and where do you ship to? We ship to the continental U.S. and we also have a um, small storefront in Cedarburg, but also we have a website that you can go to. We're on all social media at this point. We have um, some local so local stores, but we're hoping to get into more stores in the Cedarburg and Mequon area. What, what's your website? Um, www.cedarcreekorganics.com. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm here with Helen Yotes, and you just released your new book February 1st yes. called Goodberry, Badberry, Knowing What is Good and What is Bad, basically. Where did the influence of this book come from? Well, it was I needed some confidence on, on identifying berries in the wild. I was hiking in, in Denver, outside of Denver, and I ran into a Prunus virginiana, the choke cherry, and I didn't recognize it. I recognized it, but I just didn't have the confidence to believe that that's what it was. And I run into these plants a lot, and I said, I need to understand their ranges better and how to grow them, and then whether it needs pectin to make a jelly out of it. So it just kind of started from there, and it's been a great journey. What was one of your biggest surprises in writing this book? Because we all have, when we all experience these things, we're all like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize this. Beauty berry. Okay. It makes a fantastic jelly. <laughs> and, and, and then your other book, your, one of your, your first book, Gardening with Confidence, which yes. is your website's named after. Yes. Uh, what is that book about for people who may not have uh, heard of that? It's a, a design perspective. It kind of helps you um, 
understand your space, like, you know, where you would want to put a bench, a garden bench, and why you'd want to put it there, you know, whether it's safety to have, you know, something comfortable behind you, or if it's going to be near the roses so you can smell them, or as a focal point in the garden. So it talks about how to build wildlife habitats, how to had a place in arbor, things to consider when, when putting a vine over the arbor. So it's a, it's a pack full of useful information. Kind of a, a blueprint of what maybe it your is. land would want to be look like. It is, and, and some tips on why you wouldn't want to do that, because you don't even think, you know, well, why, why does it need to be there? Why do I not want this vine on my arbor because, you know, it's going to shed? Oh. Yeah, Grandma always did it, so why should, you know, that type yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. For people who want to pick up your new book, Goodberry, Badberry, or all the other books that you've wrote, what's the best place that you can find this information? Uh, the books at? Well, they're in your independent bookstores, um, and they're also online at Amazon, of course, and then indiebooks.com, and uh, they're here at the show. All right. Well, thank you very much, Helen, for joining us. Great. Thank you. Okay, so we're here with Megan Kane, and she is the Creative Vegetable Gardener. Why do you call yourself the Creative Vegetable Gardener? Well, one of the sessions that I ta just taught, we talked about how to bring more design inspiration to your garden. So I really love a really productive garden, but I also like one that is really aesthetically beautiful as well. So I feel like when you have a really pretty garden and a creative garden, it brings a, a whole other layer of joy to it. Great, and now you, you wrote a book about uh, food preserving, but without canning. What, when, what is the name of the book and what can we expect from the book? The book is called Super Easy Food Preserving. And then, so when I first started learning how to preserve food, I thought that canning was the only way. And I realized that I didn't really like canning that much. It's, it's a lot of work. It often happens on a really hot day. You make a big mess of your kitchen. You spend a lot of time cleaning up. And so I thought there must be easier ways to put away food. I'm also a minimalist in everything I do. So I always like the most simple solution. And so over the years, I tried to figure out what's the easiest way to put away all these vegetables. Um, often it's not canning and so I found myself over time talking to a lot of other gardeners and saying, hey did you know that you could freeze kale raw or you can just cut up peppers and put them in your freezer or store carrots in your fridge um, and so I was having a lot of conversations and a lot of people didn't know those things so I decided to write a book. That sounds great. Now you started the first youth urban garden in the Madison area. What was your inspiration behind that and what were some challenges you had faced? Yeah, so I was, I was hired by Community Groundworks, which is in Madison, to help develop the, one of the first kids' garden programs in Madison. Um, they, I think at that point, they started, they had already had a few gardening programs and just really saw the need and the importance to show kids where food is coming from. Mm -hmm. The, that gardening program worked with a lot of low-income kids uh, who weren't necessarily getting outside and weren't eating vegetables. And so it was really to give kids a, a experience with nature and then specifically around how to grow food. And, and we did a lot of cooking and art projects um, to kind of give get them excited about being outside and, and eating vegetables and growing food. That's fantastic. Now, where can people find you and your book and, and all of your information? I have a website with the blog, and it's at creativevegetablegardener.com. Well, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm here with the Seed Keeper Company, Carol and Carrie of the seedkeepercompany.com. We're going to talk about a couple of things here. Let's first talk about people ask us a lot of times, how long are seeds good for? And it really depends on how you store them. It really does. Uh, vegetable seeds can last up to 10 years, but if they're not stored in a nice dry container or a, in a, a dark, dry area, they're not going to last as long. So our seed keepers are designed so that your seeds are safely protected in order, in A to Z order, and uh, we also have monthly dividers for succession gardening. We've included lots of great tools to help your uh, gardening be successful, your seed sowing be successful, but really keeping seeds in proper storage is key to their viability from year to year. So we really recommend you use a seed keeper to do that. And the division cards are not just alphabetical. They actually have information regarding, well, this one's composting is hot, talks about different techniques and tips about gardening, and it's, it's just not a card with a, a letter on it. No, in fact, uh, all of our cards have original material on them. They're like little garden books inside of each seed keeper. They all have ISBN numbers in both of our seed keepers, so they're, they're all original content, and it's, it's useful information, and it's all designed so that you're successful in the garden. That's our whole purpose. And you keep adding new things to it. You get a burlap girdle now with the seed keeper. Yes, in the seed keeper deluxe in the home farmer, you get a one-gallon burlap girdle, which 
which is a perfect way to grow. It's easy. They come in one, five, and ten gallon sizes. The ten gallon we use to plant all of our tomatoes in, and the best part about that, typically when you buy a ten gallon pot, it can weigh like 10, 15 pounds. Ours weighs less than a pound before you start to add the soil to it. So it makes gardening very easy. You have the ability to turn them for maximum sun exposure, easy to work with at the end of the season, dump the soil, fold them up and put them away and you're ready to grow again. Now, one thing that you ladies do that I really don't know a lot of other companies is you support school gardens or you sponsor them. I know some companies uh, support them, but you sponsor them uh, state by state? Right. We actually recognize school gardens okay. through our Seed Keeper project. It is, we're excited to say this is the sixth year. We recognize school gardens in all 50 states. So to date, we've recognized more than 250 school gardens. This year, it'll make it 300. We have some new partners that have joined with us. We have uh, Seeds of the Month Club and Garden which is a book written by Maria Zampini and Pam Bennett that will be going to each school along with a certificate of recognition, a letter, and a seedkeeper home farmer. These schools, are they get very excited about this. It's a really, really important thing. We think school gardens are critical. They're important in every type of community we have in our country. Uh, rural, urban, uh, busy hands can't get in trouble, and they learn how to nurture and love and grow seeds. And we think it's a really important thing for kids to know where their food comes from. Right, and this is not just school gardens. You told the story of a correctional facility, I think it was in Idaho, yes. that made these kids yes. have a purpose in life or made them feel yes. like they were wanted. These, these, were, these were kids. There's a school there called the Anderson School at uh, the Southwest Idaho uh, Juvenile Detention Facility. And the headmaster, I guess, or the warden, <laughs> he decided they were going to have a garden and they did this and these kids got out there and they gave tons, literally tons literally. of food to the local food pantry for homeless people. And so if you have kids that are feeling not so good about themselves and they begin to participate in a program like that where they're giving back to society, they begin to feel great. And look what's going to happen. Maybe we're going to turn a kid's life around. Absolutely. Again, your website for people who want to purchase this and, and see all this other stuff you got going on? SeedKeeperCompany.com and check us out on Twitter at SeedKeeperCo and we're on Facebook, The SeedKeeper Company. We share everything. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. I'm here with Joel Karsten, the author of the Straw Bell Garden book. Now, we did Straw Bell Garden this past year. You know, you, you see things on TV, you read books. It works exactly as the book says it does. And we're, we went from one straw bell, we're going to go to about six, seven this year. Fantastic. Now, there is some questions that we've gotten from our, our viewers. Where do you get straw bells from? And you've got a place on your website that is kind of a network, don't you? Yeah, it's a free site we built for farmers to list bales for sale. And then if you're looking for bales, you can find the contact information or you can place a straw bales wanted ad. And it's all free. It's called Straw Bale market.com um, and we just provide it as a service um, if you get a copy of the book you'll see on the back cover we talk about straw bale market um, just it's a great resource for people to be able to connect but at the Wisconsin show here people are stopping by leaving their business cards different farmers that have straw bales so uh, it, that's a good place to go is directly to your friendly farmer as well now you were talking that you know straw bells typically what we see back here you can take big round bells and figure out a way of cut them in half and have it, it may not be the my, most ideal thing but it could work yeah I do have lots of people that will do that they they have the great big round bales and they'll cut them in half with a chainsaw kind of gums up your saw so borrow your neighbors like you suggested and when you cut it in half and then flop it down so you have two big donuts if you try to use a whole big bale it's hard to keep the whole thing wet and if you can't keep a bale wet you're gonna get mice rodents um, so I really encourage you to cut it in half. That way you can keep it nice and moist all the way through. And you'll get at least two years out of those big, those halves of the big round bales. Same thing with the big squares. People have a lot of big squares. If you can figure out how to cut those in half, uh, they work well also. Now, any type of straw works, but rye straw bales, there's some techniques that not all seeds are going to germinate in rye. There's some, some things you got to do. Yeah, rye is notorious for preventing germination of some seeds. So if you're using rye bales, you never want to put your seeds directly in the bale. Um, some seeds will still germinate, right. but there are certain ones that won't. You can Google a list of those if you want to find it. But um, I encourage people to put a seed bed on top of the bale using sterile planting mix, 
never use your soil because if you put a shovel of soil, you just bring weed seeds and disease and insects. Div you're, 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 yeah, you're right. going back. Exactly. Yeah. So get some sterile planting mix, make a seed bed an inch or two inches deep, and then put your seeds, whatever you're going to plant from seed, in that. If you're doing transplants, you can put those right into the rye bale. That won't hurt anything. It's about germination. It's not about root growth or anything like that. It's just about the seed germinating. I see. And, and uh, for people who want to get your book that didn't come to the expo, where's the best place they can get it? buy it on my website I'll send them an autographed copy it's strawbellgardens.com um, or you can just google strawbell gardens and you'll find us we're everywhere we're on Facebook if you go to learn to grow a strawbell garden on Facebook we have just under 100,000 followers there that are talking about strawbell gardening all the time there's several groups on Facebook as well that I'm not part of that talk about strawbell gardening and all the benefits of it etc so there's lots of information available out there but if you really want the 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 secret recipe and the techniques that I've developed, my method, uh, the best place is to get a copy of the book. Right, because you just can't throw a bale on the ground right. and plant seed. There's a conditioning process right. and you go about over that right. in the book. And there's a lot of people online that'll tell you how to do it and give you their advice. But I always tell people, if you're gonna learn to do sword swallowing, do you want to learn from somebody who's done it and who invented sword swallowing? Or do you want to learn from somebody who just learned yesterday and wrote a book about it? Right, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. Thanks a lot, I appreciate it. I'm here with Melinda Meyer. She's a 30-year veteran of horticultural. She's an expert in, in gardening and landscaping. She's got over 20 books she's wrote, and she's syndicated on 130 television and radio programs nationwide with her Melinda Moments. We're going to talk about a couple of things here. You they just talked this morning on pollinating gardens, creating pollinating gardens. Now, give a little bit about what you spoke about. Well, basically, we want to look at creating a habitat, places for our bees, butterflies, beetles, and hummingbirds to live, water, food, and shelter for them to raise their young. So thinking beyond just the monarchs or just the honey honeybees, our native bees, and anything else that helps pollinate our plants. Some, some things that we as gardeners neglect. Oh, exactly. Or maybe some of our gardening partners or the non-gardeners in our lives go, ooh, yuck, they're really good guys in the garden. Now, I spoke about you've been doing this for 30 years. How did you get involved in the gardening? Was it something your parents did or was it something you picked up later on? You know, my dad was a gardener but never let us in the garden, so that may be the key to getting your kids <laughs> to garden. It must be fun if they don't let me in. And so I was always surrounded by plants and my teachers taught plant science. I never dissected a frog and I have a master's degree, but I've cut up a lot of plants. So I think it just was the environment. I love science and I love people, but I like applied science. I like touching the soil. And boy, once you get turned on to gardening, there's no going back. Right. And, and we've talked, you know, uh, Peon Smith, Joe Lample, as well as you. You're never going to learn everything. Oh, that's why these things are great. I share what I know. Gardeners share back with me. I pass that along, what I've learned along the way and what they have. And that's what I love about gardeners. They share. I once heard a great saying that a master gardener told me that if you have a dollar and I have a dollar, I give you your my dollar, you give me yours, we still only have a dollar. I have an idea, you have an idea, we share, we both now have two ideas. Well, let's talk about some of the 20 books you've wrote here. You've got Midwest Garden, uh, Garden Handbook here. What's, what's this book about and what was the influence behind writing this? Well, one of the things is I travel all over the country. Obviously, I'm based in the Midwest, so that's my basis. But I like to tell people things I've learned, but also that gardeners are always asking me, you know, things that they're not finding in other books. So the Midwest Gardener's Handbook, each chapter, let's say annual, starts with the basics on caring for annuals, profiles some annuals that are pretty easy to grow throughout the Midwest and then at the end of the chapter what to do when. So it's a little month by month and a little bit of the gardener's guide all put into one. And, and you said information that other gardeners couldn't find so you've done the research, you've done had the experience so you put it in a book so people can find that information. You bet. I was an extension agent for 12 years and so I'm basic I really believe in research base and there's a lot of good information in our extension publications that sometimes people don't find and so I'm trying to take that and answer the questions I hear as I go out and speak or when I'm working in the garden myself. Now for people who want to pick up and check out your books, you've got a new DVD set out as well. What's the best place to find these, these products? If you want to find out more about the Great Courses DVDs, the books that I've written, go to melindamyers.com. That's my website. And then garden centers do carry, garden centers, bookstores carry my books, Great Courses website. But if you start with my website, I've got lots of free information, video, audio tips, frequently asked questions, and links to other resources that will help you in your garden. Thank you very much, Melinda. Thank Thank you. Thanks for watching. We appreciate you taking your time. And if you want more information about anybody we talk to, all of those links will be in the show notes below.
Join us next time for more organic gardening and food preserving. I'm Joy Baird. And I'm Holly Baird. And this has been the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.